Hello, my name is Jenny Valentine and I've come to Moon Lane TV to talk to you about my brand new book, A Girl Called Joy. This is a proof copy. When you have a proof copy, it's not quite right. It doesn't have any pictures in it, one thing, which is a shame because the pictures are amazing. Um, and it doesn't even have the right title. This one says, bring a little joy into your life, which I look quite cross when I'm saying, I mean, bring a little joy into your life. The book is called A Girl Called Joy. I don't even have one yet. This is how sneak peek this preview is. Let me tell you a little bit about Joy Applebloom. She is the most cheerful, most resilient, um, most resourceful character I could come up with in a year of lockdown and things we weren't allowed to do. I tried to see the positives, I tried to see the sunny sides, and Joy is really, really good at doing exactly that. You notice her umbrella, it's kind of sunny underneath. I'd really like one of those umbrellas, but I will have to tell you at this point, just to be clear that this book is not about a magic umbrella. There is no magic in this book whatsoever. Although I do think that being able to see the positive side and everything, being able to see the silver linings is a bit of a superpower. Joy hasn't had what I would call a normal life. She's not lived in one place. She's traveled all around the world since before she was born, actually. Her family, her mum, her dad, and her big sister, Claude, have traveled everywhere. She has been in volcanoes in Iceland and in the desert, and she's seen whole mountainsides of butterflies in Mexico and stars like you wouldn't believe in the Joshua Tree National Forest in California and she's seen so many things and she's only 10 and then her family stopped traveling and they have to move back home to her granddad's house which is in sort of normal street normal town normalsville um, something that we would all recognize as normal and it's difficult being new and not understanding all of the rules and not knowing what everyone else is very used to. And it's difficult being unusual and on the edge and um, a bit lonely. Um, and sometimes you don't have magic to fix the difficult things. And as Joy says, when you don't have magic, your problems are more every day and harder to fix. So she has to rely on her ability to be really positive and see the opportunities where other people would see problems. Um, this is something I think a lot of us have learned to do over the past year. And I think Joy is a bit of a master. I learned some things from Joy while I was writing this book. I'm gonna read you a little chapter from quite near the beginning. And um, I must tell you before I start reading this chapter that the place that they've moved to is her grandfather's house. And her grandfather's name is Thomas E. Blake, E, like the initial E. She doesn't know his middle name, so she makes a few guesses. I think she makes three guesses in this chapter, see if you can spot them. There's one really early on. So here we are, chapter five of A Girl Called Joy. Thomas Earthling Blake's house is in a street called Plain Tree Gardens, which I would call imaginative, and Claude says is a blatant open and shut case of false advertising. We haven't seen one plane tree, not anywhere, and the gardens are about the size of envelopes and all paved over and full of enormous bins. I was looking forward to a street full of plane trees. They have flaky bark and big round seed clumps like a tennis ball, and they are really tall and easy to climb because of the way they spread their branches like an octopus with open arms. I'm quite good at climbing trees and I've been high up in quite a few. The houses in plain tree-less gardens don't have personalities of their own. They are identical, which makes them impossible to tell apart. This is a problem when you are coming home from the park and can't remember which house you're living in. They all have exactly the same low black metal gates and stingy little windows and thundercloud grey front doors. I have daydreamed about going out in the middle of the night with some spray cans and painting those doors bright new colours until there is no more thundercloud grey in sight apart from in the actual sky. But at the moment, the only difference I can find between the houses is the numbers. Now I have committed it to memory, I can say with total confidence that this one is number 48. The people here don't seem to do much talking to each other. 
Everyone keeps their head down and their eyes looking the other way. And nobody is what I would call welcoming. Not so far anyway, especially when you are mistakenly, but perfectly innocently trying to let yourself into their house. But I am working on making friends in my own way. I have one or two plans up my sleeve that might involve free cupcakes, homemade lemonade, a neighborhood book swap, and a food of the world day, if I'm ever allowed. Claude says, you don't live in a children's book from the 1970s, you know. And I say, no, I live in boring old plain tree gardens and I'm trying to make the best of it. Thomas Earwax Blake doesn't know his neighbor's real names, even though they have all been living here for longer than I've been able to ride a bike. The ones on the left he calls the shouters and the ones on the right he calls messy. Claude wonders under her breath what names they might have for him. I pretend I don't hear her saying that. Mum and Dad shake their heads and say that this street and this town and this country have changed a lot in the 10 years that they have been gone. They also shake their heads and say that 48 Plain Tree Gardens has not. Then they look straight at me. Come on, Joy, Dad says, and Mum says, you can find a silver lining on any cloud. I look outside at the low drizzle. I know the sun is up there somewhere, shining away, even if I can't actually see it. OK, then, I tell them, I'll do my best. On the inside, the house is mostly brown and yellow, with the odd pop of green that reminds me of a mossy forest. Claude calls the colour scheme things that have gone off in the fridge. The furniture is moody and dark, with handles that rattle at you when you walk past as if they're trying to tell you something. The flowers on the sitting room curtains are big and squashed, like they've been trodden on by a herd of cows in the rain. The brown and yellow liner on the kitchen floor looks new in some places and worn almost to nothing where Grandad has spent 40 years treading at the sink next to the cooker and right by the back door. There are extremely breakable china ornaments everywhere of frowning dogs and cats and old fashioned people who look like they were turned to stone in the middle of a particularly boring conversation. Mum says it's all exactly the same as it was when she was growing up. And Claude says, well, no wonder you left and didn't want to come back then. Mum hasn't really got an answer for that. We have always been very good at sharing small spaces. We have curled up together in tents and on trains and in cabins, and it has been better than fine. We have lived together in smaller places, much smaller. So I'm still trying to work out why 48 Plain Tree Gardens feels like an all day game of sardines without enough of the actual fun. Grandad has his own bedroom, of course, same as always. Claude and I share the other one, and mum and dad sleep downstairs on the sofa, which is making them look about as crumpled in the mornings as their sheets. Everybody seems to want to use the bathroom and the kettle and the hot water and the toaster and the landline at the same time. There is always someone in the one doorway you need to go through, or someone else you have to stop for halfway down the stairs. There are chairs you can and can't sit on, things you must and mustn't touch. We crowd around the same objects like they are the sugar and we are the ants. Claude says we are in Thomas Emperor Blake's way and that he is used to having the whole place to himself. She thinks this is the definition of ironic, seeing as if it was up to her, he could have it all back and just keep it. According to my sister, Grandad's empire is a dump. It hasn't got one thing to recommend it and no distinguishing features whatsoever. She says her review would give it zero stars for everything and she wouldn't even send her worst enemy here. I'm not sure who her worst enemy is at the moment. Maybe mum or dad for bringing us here in the first place. When I try to ask, she glares at me like I am another huge waste of her extremely precious time. And I worry for half a second or so that her worst enemy might in actual fact be me. Claude has asked our parents about 89 times how long they think we will be staying here. A year, according to mum, but dad says it's more like two, and both of their faces say they actually have no clue. Here, Claude says, in this house. And they say, for the time being, we all just need to find our feet. Claude groans like a howler monkey and says it already feels like forever. She stretches the word out agonizingly slowly, so it takes its own personal forever to happen. I put my hands over my ears and remember some of the times we have found our feet in other places, like the red hot dust of Jaipur or the ice cold water of a Swiss mountain stream 
from a noisy street corner in New York City, looking up at all the buildings and the little squares of sky while our heartbeats quicken. I remind myself that we know how to do this and it is all just a matter of time. Isn't she great? I just love her. Um, she, it's not easy. It, she's not gonna find everything easy. Being positive doesn't mean that life isn't difficult. And I've tried very hard not to make her one of those annoyingly positive people who just carry on banging on about how everything's actually fine when it isn't. So she does acknowledge that things are difficult. For example, Joy and her sister Claude have never, not ever, not even once, set foot inside a school, not even a toe. They've been homeschooled wherever they are in the world and they haven't ever had to be in a school. Can you imagine? Well, actually we all can now, can't we? Because you haven't been able to go to school, but can you imagine arriving at a school, an actual physical school, having never been in one when you're 10? She doesn't understand how the rules work. She doesn't understand what she's supposed to do. She doesn't understand why her teacher doesn't like her and her teacher does not like her. And she finds it hard to make friends. And because she's so positive, she hasn't been expecting any of these obstacles and she needs to work out a way of getting around them. I'm not gonna tell you too much more about the story because I don't want to give it away. But instead of telling you any more about what happens to Joy, I'd like you to imagine what it would be like to live in a completely different place to the one that you're used to living in. You can make the place up, it doesn't have to be real. Or you can write about a place you've been to and would quite like to live in. Or you can write about a place you'd like to go to and imagine what it's like to wake up there and for that to be your everyday normal place to wake up and do things and how differently they do things. It might be a place that your mum or your dad or your grandma or your best friend has told you about. It might be a place that doesn't exist. It could be out of space, I guess. That's one place Joy hasn't been, but there's still time. Anyway, I really hope that you've enjoyed listening to me read a little bit of this book. And I hope that when you meet Joy, you like her as much as I do. And I hope that you're happy that you've had a sneak peek preview of a book that's not even out yet. It's out at the end of April. And I really look forward to coming into actual schools and meeting actual children and talking about joy.